I've been asked to share my research journey and how I came to embark upon this particular journey. The title I chose was Bringing Beauty from the Ashes. This quote by Sojourner Truth, abolitionist and former slave, then I will speak truth upon the ashes. As my presentation proceeds, I hope that this title that I chose and this quote will become very clear as to why these were my choices to begin with. My husband, Paul, and I took a DNA test from Ancestry in 2019. I really didn't expect to find much new information about my heritage or family. Maybe the biggest thing that I wanted to find out was my DNA heritage and see the different percentages of my ethnicity estimates. The findings were England and Northwest Europe, 23%, Sweden and Denmark, 21%, Norway, 21%, Scotland, 18%, Wales, 12%, and Ireland, 5%. And that was all interesting. And then in January, 2020, I received a private message on my ancestry messages. And it was a, uh, hello cousin, looks like we're related. And it would be great to find out our connection in our family tree. Erica Crawford Thomas lives in Texas. I live in Utah. Erica is 10 years younger than me. She's a high school teacher, a wife, a mom, and a grandma. Erica has a Bachelor's of Science in Criminal Justice, a Master's of Education and Reading Literacy, and in the spring of 2022, Erica and her son both received their MBA degrees at the same time at Lamar University. Erica and I emailed back and forth and really got to know each other. We both were very open and friendly with each other. Erica's life story was very inspiring, and this connection was a really wonderful beginning to our researching together. I will be honest, I was afraid that Erica would hate me. She was the descendant of enslaved ancestors and I was the descendant of slave owners. Instead, Erica's view was that together we could forge a new family culture in our shared family, and one of unity, love, and no hate or racism. Erica's approach and personality initiated this shared family history journey in a very positive light. Mark Cohn wrote these lyrics to the song entitled, the things we've handed down. And these things that we have given you, they are not so easily found, but you can thank us later for the things we've handed down. The baby girl in this picture is me. The woman on the left is my maternal grandmother, Erlene Ellingson. The woman on the right is my paternal grandmother, Emma Jean Blunt Lyles. I called her Nana Lyles. We went to visit my Nana Lyles when I was 10 years old in Graham, Texas. She was a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, and she was very interested in genealogy. She gave this book to me during this visit, and she was especially proud of the fact that we were related to the presidential candidate, Jimmy Carter. She had helped him campaign for um, and she sent this gold peanut necklace to me to wear after the visit. She made sure that I knew that Jimmy Carter was my sixth cousin. My Nana Lyles ran for the House of Representatives in her district, and she was the owner of a real estate company. She also was a very devoted and intentional grandma. My parents were divorced when I was five years old, and my mother, brother, and I moved from Colorado to Portland, Oregon to live near her parents, who were a loving and an amazing support system to our family. My mother was the sole financial supporter for my brother and I, and things were very tight financially. There was a two-year period that we had moved three hours away from my maternal grandparents, closer to my mom's best friend and her family. And during that time, we did not have a phone. And my Nana Lyles would write us letters and schedule phone dates where we would call her collect on, her, on our payphone, and we would get to talk to her and my great-grandma, Nana Blunt. My Nana Lyles also bought us a piano so that we could take piano lessons, and my children took lessons on that same piano. My mom would fill our home with music, playing the piano, and we would sing together. My Nana Lyles offered to buy us a house in Texas during that visit that she had flown us all out to visit her in Texas for. My mom loved our Nana Lyles too, but my mom declined her generous offer as my mom's dad's health was not good. She didn't want to move us away from him again. He was a wonderful grandpa and filled a father role in our life. Now, just three years later, I was 13 years old. It was 1979. And in January, my Nana Lyles passed away at 59 years old. And in May, my grandpa Ellingson passed away at 63 years old. This book, Ancestors and Friends by William Lusk 
Crawford sat on my bookshelf until a rare snowstorm in 1989 in Portland, Oregon. We had 10 inches of snow. Now, Portland has very few snow plows, so the city really gets shut down. Maybe it was cabin fever, who knows? But I pulled the book off the shelf and I found that my Nana Lyles had gifted me my ancestry on the Blunt line going back to my 10th great grandpa, Blunt. Inside the book, there was a picture of my second great grandpa, Oliver Marshall Blunt, and his second wife and his children, including my great grandpa, uh, John Franklin Blunt. I kept the picture out of the book and put it in a collage frame in our home. And my second great grandfather's name, Oliver Marshall Blunt, stayed very familiar to me throughout the years as I would pass by his picture in the hall. As Eric and I began our detective journey to uncover exactly where our family connection begins, I noticed that Erica's maiden name is Crawford, the same as the author of the book that my Nana Lyles gave me when I was 10. Erica is from Texas. My Nana Lyles and her family uh, for several generations are from Texas. Erica tells me that her mother's maiden name is Carter. Well, I'm absolutely sure that this book will, that my Nana Lyles gave me will be the key to help us unlock our family connection. Inside the front cover of the book and the back cover of the book are pedigree charts. The front cover is a pedigree for the Crawfords and the back cover is a pedigree chart for the Blunt family, beginning with my second great grandpa, Oliver Marshall Blunt. I take a picture of both pedigree charts, the cover of the book, the table of contents, and I text the pictures to Erica. And I tell her that I'm sure that our connection must Crawford and Carter lines. Erica tells me that we may be connected with those two lines, but she's quite sure that Oliver Marshall Blunt is uh, going to be the line where we will connect for sure. Erica shares a family history story that her aunts have given her. Now, this story is a gold mine for our detective's journey. And it is the Marshall's family history. Rosa Marshall, who was born in 1825 in Talbot County, Georgia. Her husband, Benjamin Marshall, was born in Talbot County, Georgia. They had four sons and one daughter. Rosa also had four mulatto children, one who is Marshall Marshall. Marshall Marshall was born in Talbot County, Georgia, and he married Amelia Mahoney. Amelia was born in 1855. They were married by Reverend John Holmes. And their children were Jim, Albert, Alexander, Bill, Mariah, Mihaela, Marshall Jr., Amelia, Thornton, and Susie. Marshall Marshall also had a son named Jeff B. Marshall. Marshall Marshall was a farmer, and on March 6, 1883, he bought a mule named Kate from James Florney Marshall for a 1,000 pounds of middling cotton. On March 22, 1882, Marshall Marshall's brother, Albert, mortgaged his mule and a cow to Sewell Gilbert for $5. Research so far has failed to present any information about Marshall's two siblings, Albert and Amy Marshall. It is reasonable to deduce that the Marshall family as we know it today is a result of the slave Rosa Marshall and her slave owner, William Marshall Blunt, a prominent slave owner in Talbot County with a plantation along the old Alabama road. Bluff Springs Church is a short distance down the street from the plantation. It is believed that Marshall Marshall was the child of William Marshall Blunt. And the writer says that when I posed this question to Mrs. Sarah Marshall, his granddaughter, she simply smiled at me and then retrieved a copy of the Marshall genealogy chart and presented it to me. This was researched by Betty J. Lawrence in Columbus, Georgia. Now, this story sent me searching for William Blunt Marshall in every branch of my family tree, always opening more and more hints on each person that I looked at, learning ever more about my family, and also learning that the number of slave owners in my family tree were truly too numerous to keep track of. Opening wills and seeing enslaved people being willed often with the phrase and their offspring to the slave owner's posterity. Truly shocking, and yet there was the truth in the legal documents after legal document. I was absolutely obsessed with my research from January 2020 to May 2020. And finally, I found William Blunt Marshall. He's my first cousin six times removed. He had owned and fathered four of Rosa Marshall's children. Erica Crawford Thomas and I are seventh cousins. 
Marshall Marshall Sr. is my second cousin five times removed, and here he is with his daughters, Mariah and Susie Marshall. We also have an actual marriage certificate for Marshall Marshall and his wife, Amelia Mahone. Marshall Marshall and Amelia Mahone were both born into slavery, but were able to die free persons. This marriage certificate is so precious because slaves did not have birth certificates, marriage certificates, or death certificates. Most of the documentation of those who were enslaved came from the wills and probation records of their slave owners. And sometimes the slave schedules, cell of slaves, and slave manifests would list their names, but not often. All of those records are related to the slave owner. So if you don't know your enslaved ancestor's slave owner's name, then it will be next to impossible to trace your enslaved person's ancestry. For those of us who are descendants of slave owners, it can be a horrendous thing to acknowledge. However, by acknowledging it, we can help truly say that black lives do matter and we can each share their names that are our ancestors enslaved and we can make our trees public, we can make our DNA results public, and we can be a force in changing our family culture, and we can embrace our African-American cousins and help honor their ancestors. Erica introduces me to another cousin, Kathy Marshall, and the three of us work on each of our family connections in this crazy family line together for over a year. Kathy is 10 years older than me. She is retired from the California Highway Patrol where she worked for 36 years as a researcher and analyst and technical writer. Kathy has been exploring her family roots for over four decades. Since 2016, Kathy has written a series of family heritage books, which investigate her enslaved ancestors and their descendants. After her research, she visits the homeland of her ancestors, and she visited the Deep South, Midwest, East Coast, and the ancestors and, and Europe. Kathy says that she truly believes that the ancestors are smiling. I share that deep belief, and I feel that my Nana Lyles has been a part in this connection between us and is happy for the new family history culture that's being written between the three of us cousins. The shared DNA that Kathy and I have is 4.1%. Kathy is also a mom and a grandma and has been in a loving relationship for over 17 years. Connecting and working closely with Erica and Kathy, two very accomplished and talented women, I confess that I felt slightly intimidated. I am just a high school graduate. I do have 64 college credits. I was a stay-at-home mom, daycare provider, and ran a home preschool while raising my kids. I am passionate about family history and have had many special and honestly miraculous connections researching other family lines in my own family and in my husband's family lines. But here I was working with two very talented and accomplished women, both descendants of enslaved ancestors. And those feelings uh, quickly dissipated as Erica and Kathy embraced me as a friend and a cousin. We communicated about many deep subjects in our lives and our research conversations via email would sometimes occur at one or 2 a.m. for Kathy and I. In May of 2020, George Floyd had just been murdered by Minneapolis police. And Black Lives Matter went from a social media protest organized by three women in 2013 to the acquittal of George Zimmerman for shooting and killing Black teen Trayvon Martin, who accidentally knocked on the wrong door to a national organization that demanded, uh, demanded accountability for the killings of dozens of African Americans by police and others. The summer of 2020, tens of millions in the US and around the world marched under the slogan that Black Lives Matter. This little family history research journey for the three of us cousins working together, it felt good to be involved in it. It felt like I was actually personally doing something with my time and energy to say that 100% that I believe that Black Lives Matter and I wasn't marching under a banner, but it was um, my own hours of quiet research, and I was trying to make a difference. Kathy prepares to take an, another trip to her ancestors' homeland in Georgia and Alabama after researching the Marshall Line. 
Inspired by the Roots Tech 2021 presenter and author Sharon Morgan, descendant of enslaved ancestors who took a trip with her DNA cousin, a descendant of a slave owner, where they termed the trip gather at the table when they went to their homeland of their ancestors' family connection. Kathy reaches out to Erica and I and several of her other cousins that she has communicated with in her research journey for the Marshall family line. Her requests are maybe a hope to have to meet for lunch or a few hours and to be able to have this gather at the table experience. She sends a copy of her itinerary. It's a Sunday afternoon. I am reading her email aloud to my husband, Paul, and uh, meeting with her for lunch or for a few hours is definitely out of the question for me. I live in Utah and she will be in Georgia. I go to reply that, sorry, I won't be able to meet up and have a wonderful time. And my husband, Paul, looks at me and he says, you have been obsessed and worked so hard on this for a year and a half. You have to go. It sounds too crazy and extravagant. I just can't do it. He pushes the issue and says, no, you need to do this. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity to do with your cousin. Well, I message Kathy and I tell her this suggestion and she is thrilled. She offers to share her rental car and her hotel room. We Paul and I purchase airline tickets for the following weekend. I fly out Sunday, May 23rd to May 27th. And this is a little video of our, our time together there. This is a work in progress, a renovation of a home. This is, this is my partner in crime. And he says, we're going to go do it. We're going to go see this place and ask for forgiveness later. State representatives don't want to get on the phone. Yeah, you, you need to. This is very close to the house that the Buckers are renovating. Next year, the same thing, but yeah, I've never seen a Freeman's day book and all of the expenses that were charged to them they had to pay before they could be. This is a view from the house. Right. And 
this comes from Kentucky. Are you good? You're gonna turn on water to make this go? Okay, we're, she's videoing this, so. <laughs> See, I've tried to describe how the water, like a water wheel, this is a creates the power to make things turn. I'm gonna raise this gate, and that lets the water flow through to the under the building, mm -hmm. okay. and there is a turbine wheel on there, okay. water turbine, and it produces about 25 horsepower. Wow. And then there's a what, big belt that transfers the power over to the millstone and it turns and grinds the grain. Wow. And I'll let you walk down under that way you can see. The oh. Take your time and get down that way under that field under there. Okay. I'll let you get in place and I'll turn it up. Okay. 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 I do. I still have enough juice, I hope. We'll see. Can you see? to wash them. It, okay. okay, it tells you just how to do it. Okay. But you cook them with butter and three, um, half and half if you like. Yeah, yeah. And you just, there's several recipes that uh -huh. you can eat them plain. You can put shrimp in them. Yes, sir. Shrimp, oh. 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 <laughs> that that good. good, yeah. Yes. That was a fascinating trip to take together. Of course, uh, during our trip, we were able to meet up with more cousins that Kathy in particular had worked with, but I got to meet as well. So Jennifer Owen joined us, Jennifer Kent, and then this Jim Marshall, he was amazing. He was a historian and a professional genealogist in Putnam County and showed, and showed us around a lot. He was fantastic. Michael Buckner, he saw in the, visit, in the video, was very helpful and uh, really introduced us to so many people and places. He was just awesome. Erica, who actually brought Kathy and I together, was unable to go because of work, but we got to video with her at the end. So on this screen, you'll notice several wills. And so each of us would pour over these wills, trying to find these enslaved ancestors. Kathy still hasn't determined exactly who her um, baby daddy is of her second great grandfather. And I might be saying that wrong. It might be third great grandfather, but we're still trying to pinpoint that. But these these relationships are so important to figure those things out. We also were able to visit the Talbot County Courthouse Archives Vault. The staff were very friendly and helpful. It was amazing to look over these old, old records. Kathy was able to keep the list of her enslaved ancestors organized. She had 20 pages with the enslaved ancestors and those who own them like chattel. In these screenshots, William Blunt Marshall, my ancestor, and then uh, also my ancestor, his father, Stephen Marshall, are the only ones listed. Land of Cotton, coming face to face with the reality of daily life, the experience of her enslaved ancestors was a bit sobering for Kathy. This is a picture of family of enslaved Black Americans in a field in Georgia in 1850. So Jim Marshall, our cousin in Putnam County, took us to a graveyard, and uh, you'll notice that the large gravestones of Caucasian folks 
In fact, over to the right, Kathy's standing in front of William Blunt Marshall's grave, and he actually is, is buried in the Waverly Hall Cemetery. But if you look over here where Kathy is standing behind this big sepulcher, <laughs> Behind that is bamboo and snake infested area. That is the graveyard of an unmarked slave cemetery. And they've recently excavated it in the last few years and found those remains. And then we went with Michael Buckner to another unmarked cemetery of slaves. And we just really felt like, oh, great. This is another way where the white man is just trying to erase the fact that these, and they didn't even consider them people half the time, existed. But then when we got home, Kathy sent me this video of, it was amazing. It was of exactly our family line and of William Blunt Marshall's slave cemetery. And so they shed a little more light on why these uh, graves were unmarked. Hey everybody, it's Robert coming to you with Sidestep Adventures. I'm out here with Mr. Dan Aiken again, and today we're going to take a look at a couple cemeteries, but before we do that, we're going to learn a little bit about some people that are buried in these cemeteries, and also how Dan knows what he knows about area history and the cemeteries around here. Uh, first of all, I, I have a lot of people to ask me, how or why did you, how did you gain the knowledge that you have on local history? Well, I've always been interested in history. I think I've got that interest from my parents. They, they, they taught me to uh, be interested in things of the past and I learned a lot growing up around uh, my grandmothers. And growing up here in Waverly Hall, I was the only kid my age right here in town. And I really had no other people to play with, so I spent a lot of time with the older folks. I spent a lot of time in the neighborhood here, uh, sitting on the front porch on Sunday afternoons with my parents and with the neighbors, and then uh, in uh, the town of Tarleton nearby where my grandmother lived. We would go over there and sit on the porch on Sunday afternoons, and I found myself just listening to uh, stories of long ago. Well, my, my dad was in the plumbing business here in Waverly Hall, and my, I'm, I'm number five out of six kids. Well, my older brothers were his helpers. And as time progressed along, they went on and did their own thing and I became his helper. And I started at around five or six years of age, going into houses around here with them, with, with him doing work. And I found myself sitting, oftentimes when he was under the house or under a kitchen cabinet or, or somewhere doing work, I would find myself sitting in there in the kitchen with the, the person uh, that, that he was doing work for and striking up conversation. And I found out at an early age that older people love to share their stories with someone who will listen. And I had a good ear. I didn't mind listening and I enjoyed sharing uh, stories with them. They would ask me, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I would talk to them about that and then they would tell me about their lives. Well, I would start listening to things and pretty soon I, I developed a ability to ask questions. Well, what was the drugstore like when you were a kid? And well, what, what, did, what did you do at the depot when the train came in? Did you, did you uh, go out and meet the train and, 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 and see who got on and off and so forth? And they would tell me about train rides to Columbus and so forth. But Going into all the houses around here, uh, I developed a, a ability to listen to people, both black and white, and I was really, really fascinated with the black history. And I was even more fascinated that there were one or two people here in town that would really, really open up and share their history with me. And later on, there was even more people who would open up and share their history with me. But one of the first, and one of the people that I thought the most of, was a man named Arthur Horton. And everybody knew him as Bud. Well, Mr. Bud, as we called him, he lived on the outskirts of town, and he was a member of a very, very old family here. His mother had been raised on the Marshall Plantation. Uh, the Marshall Plantation was a big farm right outside of town in Talbot County here. And uh, his mother had been raised there. 
And he was able to point onto the walls there in his house and show me the faces of all the people that he talked about and all the stories that he would tell me. He could point to each portrait on the wall. And I was really fascinated with that. Well, Mr. Bud passed away in 1980, uh, let's see. He passed away in 1982 at 96 years of age. And he had a adopted daughter who came down and liquidated everything in his house. And I happened to go into an antique shop later here and I found the pictures that were hanging on the wall there. And I knew every one of them because I remembered all the stories about them. Well, the antique dealer that had the pictures bought the frames. He didn't want the pictures. So he gave me the pictures out of the frames and I brought the pictures up here to my shop and they've been here ever since. But anyway, this right here is Mr. Bud Horton. And he was born in 1880, let's see. He was born in 1885 and died in 1982. That is his brother Julius. Julius was born in 1877 and died in 1924. This is their mother and her name was Lily Marshall Copeland Mahone. She was born on the William Marshall Plantation just outside of Waverly Hall in 1844 or thereabouts and she died in 1892. Well, she was the mother of 14 boys and four girls, according to Mr. Bud. She married Arch Horton, and Arch Horton had been a slave on the Horton Plantation in Harris County, and she had been a slave on the William Marshall Place in Talbot County. Well, after emancipation, Mr. Uh, Arch Horton and she got married, and they moved to uh, the back side of the Marshall Plantation, and they tenant farmed there for the Marshalls. And later, I think they uh, sharecropped with the Marshalls and also for the Willis family and for a couple of other families out there in that area. Well, when she died, uh, she was buried in the cemetery that you've done a video on. I believe what we call it the uh, Mahone Family Cemetery that's out on Weaver Road. Uh, I believe he told me that she was buried there along with his, uh, his father, Arch Horton. And there is a marked grave there of one of the Hortons, which I believe may be uh, one of his sisters. But anyway, this kind of puts a face with some of those unmarked graves that we are accustomed to seeing out in the woods and where we just see a rock at the head and the foot. Well, in one of my conversations with Mr. Bud, one of the things that I learned about the cemeteries here is that uh, we're out here on the front porch of the shop right in town where there's a lot of traffic. So you know it's kind of hard to hear. One of the things that I learned from Mr. Bud was the tradition of unmarked graves. In, in discussing the cemeteries around here with Mr. Bud, I asked him about his mother and his father's graves and whether or not they were marked. And he said, by marker, do you mean do they have a name on the grave? And I said, yes. And he said, no, there's no name on their graves. He said, but, and you know, I asked, was that because of the cost of a marker at the time? And he said, well, markers were pretty expensive then. He said, but there were enough of us, we could have done it if we wanted to. He said, but in our family, he says, we go by the old beliefs. And I said, and what is that? He said, well, the old way was when you die, when a family member dies, you leave your grief at the cemetery. He said, when we finished up at the cemetery and that grave was covered, he said, the men folks did the grave digging and covered the grave up. He said, when the men folks finished, you left the cemetery and you left your grief there and you never went back until there was another death and you had to go back and dig another grave or have another burial. But that was their beliefs. And their beliefs are... Uh, in other words, he said their beliefs came over with, uh, he said, back in slavery days, that, that belief was brought, as he said, from the old country. And he spoke of the old country a lot because he had stories that had been handed down. You know, these people, his family lived on the same farm in the same place for uh, 100 years. And there were 
four or five generations that had lived there and had handed stories down to one another. And he recalled that uh, his ancestors buried there in that cemetery brought with them a tradition of disguising a grave at the time of uh, a burial, that they would actually cover it with with pine straw and leaves and he said they would try to disguise it as much as possible and just leave and he said that was that was the end of, of any grief he said you left it there the picture over here on the far right is his wife's mother and daddy now mr art uh, uh, mr bud was married to uh sarah carter and this is sarah carter's mother and daddy miss sarah died in 1975 and her daddy was robert carter and her mother was Sudie Mae Marshall Carter. Now, Sudie Mae was also born into slavery. She was born around 1862 on the same Marshall plantation as Mr. Bud's mother was born. Her nickname was Suki, and I understand they had a lot of children also. They had, they were married in 1876 and were the parents of Mose Carter, Fletcher Carter, Sarah Carter Horton, Della, Francis, William, Suki, Joe, AC, and John T. Carter. Those were their children. Well, these pictures hung in Mr. Bud's house, like I said, until his death. But 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 Mr. Bud here, I learned a lot of local history from him. He loved to talk, and when he found out that I was uh, really interested, with a, with a genuine interest, he opened up to me, and I spent many cold, rainy days in his house, sitting by a heater, talking to him, and he, he, he imparted a lot of knowledge to me as far as um, local history goes. And one other thing about him, he was the local herbalist for the uh, community. A lot of people went out there and he would mix different uh, teas, root. He, he w would go down on the creek and dig yellow root. And he had a trunk that he kept all these things in. And I do remember that the, the house that he lived in was trimmed in blue and I think everyone knows that uh, that's a tradition with with some of the old black uh, uh, herbalist that they would trim things in blue to let people know that there was an herb doctor that lived in a certain house well, his windows was trimmed in blue and or, or were trimmed in blue and he had a trunk that he kept everything in and that trunk was painted blue and my mother owns the trunk to this day uh, it was it was purchased by my dad from his uh, a daughter when she liquidated the estate and uh, he was able to purchase a number of things from her but the pictures were something that I was really proud to get and were saved from the trash and they they were initially offered to a member of the family but the member of the family they were offered to was a member of the Primitive Baptist Church and that member of the family said that the Primitive Baptists did not believe in keeping photographs of the dead so that's the reason that they were sold all right so now we are in the woods um, and we're specifically on the old Marshall Plantation and even more specific than that we are on the old Marshall Slave Cemetery and as is often um, in a case like this we're absolutely surrounded by graves most of them are just indentions in the ground in fact I'll turn the camera around in just a minute and we can see a row out here and while there are a few uh, post emancipation burials out here you said that most of these graves out here are strictly graves from slavery times right yes. most of these are strictly uh antebellum days uh pre pre-civil war before emancipation uh, most of the marshals after emancipation are buried in a churchyard right over here called uh, bluff springs or they're buried at salem baptist church or they're buried 
over at the other cemetery, which is just a few miles through the woods here, uh, known as the Mahone Willis uh, Horton Cemetery. And there's some marshals buried there also. So this is this strictly began as a farm cemetery for the Marshall place. Mr. Marshall, the owner of this place, is buried in the Waverly Hall Cemetery where the Methodist Church used to be in the old days, uh, which was originally Mount Zion Methodist Church where he was a member. And when the uh, when when this was the main highway out here between Columbus and uh, what was then the capital of Georgia, Milledgeville, the state capital. Uh, this was known as the old Federal Road, and it was called the Old Alabama Road, and Mr. Marshall's house faced that road. And Henry Clay was one of the guests in his house and made a speech there, uh, Henry Clay being a Whig uh, politician prior to the war between the states. Mr. Marshall was a big-time Whig also, and Mr. Marshall was a state representative, and he represented Talbot County when the state of Georgia succeeded from the Union and he had to list his net worth and I believe he had a net worth at the time of $144,000 which was a lot of money back in those days and he had to list how many slaves he owned and I believe that he owned 88 at the time that he uh, signed up so uh, I also read once that I believe he was shown as not voting when it came time to vote whether or not to succeed that he he kind of took a uh, neutral stance. All right, so if we look down right here, you'll see a large indention. And I know that these are always kind of hard to see on camera, but if you follow up, there's another one and another one and another one. And then over there, there's another one, another one. And they are scattered all throughout these woods. And this, this would have been one of the cemeteries that Mr. Bud Horton told me about that they believed in leaving behind when uh, after the burial. If you notice, I don't see too many rocks at the head and the foot of each grave. So that leads me to think that once that burial was done, no one came back here and marked these graves in any way. Uh, there may be some out here with a head stone at the foot and the head, but I don't see too many, do you? No, I do not. I see a lot of graves, though. I do only see by, a lot of graves. Only by the uh, Indians in the earth. There's one here, and one there, and then there, and there, and there. And we are absolutely surrounded by graves out here. Um, I have actually walked to the cemetery before. I've never filmed it, and I was impressed with the amount of graves that were out here. Um, it was a little bit easier to see last time I was out here because none of the growth had started, and this tree hadn't fallen last time I was out here either but there are uh, there are a lot of graves out here and it goes pretty far back So as we come back here, we do have more that have headstones on it. So this cemetery starts all the way, if you could see my Jeep at the road, it basically starts all the way over there. And then as we come through over here, it continues down to the end here. And we do have a few that have field stones as we get into this back portion of the cemetery. We've got three in a row right here. Two more down there, and then all of these over here. Have a look at these, Dan. I just, I thought this was pretty interesting that these, all throughout there, there's no stones, but these at the back do have stones. And also look at the, look at the row right there. There's one, two, three, four, five and six and seven and eight there are a lot of them. and then over here there's one right here the field stone at the end and one right beside it now as far as i can tell as we get over here the graves kind of stop that's the furthest one that i see over there then it's terraced off and the ground is eroded 
right here. the row of field stones right here. And now we have the marked graves that are out here. I believe that there are four marked graves. Like that says Josephine Marshall. It does. Josephine Marshall, born, looks like 1949. It looks like born and died 1949. Born August 3rd, 1949, and died September. Okay, that video is quite interesting. I'm running out of time. And the two marked graves they show, one of them was the Marshall Marshall, the picture that we have. And uh, anyway, I, I wish that Kathy and I would have been able to see that while we were there, but I just thought that was fascinating. So I thought it was worth the time to, to show you that. So this is the William Blount Plantation and the, the man to the top left is his son, James Florney Marshall. His wife, uh, Rachel Anderson Meacham, is right below him. And that plantation that they're sitting in front of burnt down. And so over to the top right, you'll notice that uh, I'm standing in front of a plantation looking house. It is the Rain Tree Manor now. I believe they use it for a bed and breakfast. So after James Florney Marshall died, his son, James Meacham Marshall, in, inherited the plantation, and he rebuilt a plantation house after that one burnt down. There was a rumor that the house I'm standing in front of was it. I, I don't know. But then the graveyard over to the bottom right is the tallest, biggest one is William Blunt Marshall's headstone. And then the other two are his uh, son, James Forney Marshall and Rachel Anderson Meacham. When we were with Michael Buckner, seeing having him share with Kathy the Freeman's Day book for his family sharecroppers, after their emancipation of their slaves on their plantation was really amazing. Michael Buckner and his wife live on the same plantation that his family owned during the time of slavery. Their story is very interesting and they were just very helpful people. We were also able to visit uh, Kathy's uh, grandpa Austin Marshalls where he worked at the Columbus Railroad Station in 1913 as an oiler and that was awfully fun and special for Kathy of course and fun for me. We also went in Columbus, the church where Kathy's grandparents went, the St. James African Methodist Episcopal Church in Columbus, Georgia and Kathy's grandfather, Israel Smith, became a minister for that denomination. So that was also really special. Of course, at the end, we had time to sightsee and goof around down, down uh, the old historical Columbus, Georgia district. So that was fun. At the very end of our uh, trip, we were able to face time with Erica and we took that picture. And during our goofing around time, we stopped at a cute shop. Kathy purchased three of the vases and so each of us cousins have matching bases. And this is my shelf at home with my matching base, my picture of our FaceTime, and a picture of Marshall, 
Marshall and his daughters, Mariah and Susie. And then this is a ceramic container that Michael Buckner made at his plantation for us. I am so grateful for the research journey that I had, not just the trip, but the relationships that we had, the things we found out, and the relationships that will continue to endure. During COVID, my daughters, all three of them actually, homeschooled their kids. And my daughter, Erica, on Martin Luther King Day, she had her kids do um, a special unit. And she has a quote here with the art that they made, a hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And that was by Martin Luther King. Layla up at the top says, Jesus loves everyone. Brookie has a little sign that says, Black people and white people can be friends. And little Carly has a sign that says, Black Lives Matter. I'm so grateful for this experience. I'm grateful to be able to share this with you. And I hope if if any of you do have either, if you are the a descendant of slave owners or slave enslaved people that you'll reach out and be able to make these kind of connections. They really are life changing. And really, it's it's amazing that family history is not only a research of ancestors, but it can change uh, your family going forward as well. And thank you for your time. Thank you for listening today.